I went into vent fib 18 times. They used the paddles on me 12 different times. And the third doctor says to me, all I can tell you is someone must really want you alive. Because we thought, you know, we had lost you. Who, who comes to you, Father? And he's like, Mary, like as plain as you're standing there, right where you're standing, like she's right there. Like, and he goes, all my pain goes away. Never, ever, ever get used to the miraculous. Anyone that finds Christ, like, it's a miracle, you know? And it's like, don't ever take that for granted. Welcome to the Exposing Catholic Show, where we expose the lives, interactions, and stories of Catholics. Our guest today is Ron Nowak. Welcome on. Thank you. Of course. Glad to be here. Yeah, so you are the youth and young adult minister at St. Mary's in Hudson. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, been there for like 23 years. Awesome. Yeah. I want to start out on the miracles topic. Okay. So let's just dive in. Yeah, so um, it was just something that I was spending some time contemplating actually for another talk that um, I'm doing. And... Just kind of, it's one of the topics that comes up a lot with the youth. Um, I feel in some ways that I've been like a little spoiled in terms of um, things that I would consider miraculous um, that would be outside of the realm of like natural explanation. Um, and I see so many like... Um, young people starved for some kind of proof like something anything like and uh and then i feel like uh in some ways very um cheated that i i feel like i've experienced so many and um and others like thirst for one you know, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to like Eucharist, I would say one of the things that really helped me have a transformation was um, I'm, I'm a very sciencey guy. So I went to school for electrical and mechanical engineering and I um, just like to question things. And uh, uh, I would say, you know, Eucharist was something that was difficult for me to wrap my head around as an adult. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's something that as a child, you come to uh, believe to some extent. But uh, then when you really contemplate, okay, is this really, how could this actually be his flesh? Like, and all of those things. The thing that really helped me was miracles um, and studying Eucharistic miracles and like it just kind of opened my mind to the possibility and uh you know our, our our faith can't be based on miracles but miracles do help you know mm -hmm. and i just think of um how many people came to believe because jesus performed miracles you know uh mm -hmm. he that's that was his uh his hook like that that's how he got people coming was you know performing miracles you know doing mm -hmm. public miracles and people just like the reputation did not go around because this guy is just so loving it was this guy's doing really sweet tricks you know like <laughs> he's doing some crazy stuff you know and then what he's saying is like blowing your mind but it was the miracles that initially attracted people. So I'm okay with that, you know? Um, and um, I think sharing miracles sometimes helps other people come to faith because the miracle doesn't always have to be... First-hand experience. Yeah. I think a lot of people that came in the crowds were looking to see miracles because other people had told them about them. And then they heard his message and he got to their heart. It wasn't miracles that got to their heart. It was the message that got to their heart. Yeah. So yeah, miracles, uh, pretty young age. Um, I remember I was with my um, grandparents. We were sitting in our family room and uh, my grandmother just uh, had this just unbelievable um, uh, faith 
And yet um, she did not come across at all as super religious, okay? Like she went to church, she prayed, um, but like you went to her house and you didn't feel like it was a shrine. You know what I mean? It was just mm -hmm. like pretty normal. And then when you heard stories, you're like, what you know like just different stories that you know and uh so she had this beautiful relationship with god where god would reveal stuff to her like from a very young age you know so some of the stories i heard growing up were like both of her parents died by age of uh, i think five okay and uh her uh, or by age seven. Anyways, when she was like four, her grandfather died, or her dad died. And when he died, they thought that they felt she was too young to go to the funeral. So she stayed at home with a babysitter while everybody else was at the wake. Okay. And that night, her bedroom window opens up and her dad climbs into the window. Okay. And he kneels down and he's like, Caroline, like, you know, daddy's leaving he's going to heaven but i want you to know that he's that i'm okay that everything's good and i love you and um and so the next morning she's telling the family about this and they're all like okay well you know this is little girl dealing with death you know and mm -hmm. and then she she explained what he had on and she said but he didn't have his church shoes on he was wearing slippers and everybody was like what and uh, at the funeral home, they had lost his shoes. And so in the casket, they put his slippers on. And there was no way for her to know this, okay? Oh, and the very first thing the next morning, she's explaining what happens, you know. So then it was a couple years later that her mom died. And when her mom died, her bedroom window opens again, okay? Lock those things, right? <laughs> and her dad comes in again. Now... Sorry, but that's going to that's going to shock me, okay? She was just okay with this, you know. And, <laughs> and he kneels down at her bed and he said that that mommy is coming with me, you know, and that you're going to be okay and and she's going to be happy and she's coming to heaven. So the next morning the rest of the family wakes up with my grandmother kneeling at the bed and her mom is dead. Okay? Um and like just crazy stories like that, right? So so I'm in like sixth grade. My sister Teresa is in eighth grade. Her best friend, Anne-Marie, is dying of leukemia. And uh, so my grandmother gets these dreams where like Jesus will come to her and like give her like a message. And I'm like, like Jesus shows up, you know? And she's like, I'm like can you describe him like you know what i mean like so i'm the i'm the i don't know the constant skeptic in some ways you know but this was always just so wild to me right mm -hmm. so she uh the one day she came over the house my grandparents come over a lot and um and she's like uh we need to go visit Anne marie i'm supposed to give her a message and so then we're like what do you mean you're supposed to give her a message? She goes, well, I had a dream and Jesus told me uh, just to tell her not to be afraid, okay? And I'm like, well, she's in a coma. And, and she was like, well, let's just go. So we all go. It was my mom, my sister, Teresa, and my grandmother and I. And uh, so we're at the bedside and my grandmother just whispers this message to her, right? And uh, so then we um, all like just kind of said our goodbyes and we're like, like, just like, um, you know, each just giving her a kiss on the forehead and then we leave. And it was either the next day or the day after I was sitting in our family room and across the room, all the way on the other side of the room, there is this, uh, I don't know, a lot of people even know this term, but it was a record player. Okay, it's like uh, it used to be these round things that like you'd put right like there. a yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, so there's this record player, and below it there's this rack of all these records. Okay, and there's a little lip on the very front of that rack rack, so you have to kind of pick up the album and pull it out. Okay, mm -hmm. well, a record rolls out of its sleeve, 
over that little ridge in the front, drops down onto the ground, and I, I hear this thud, and I look over, and there's a record rolling slowly across a shag carpet. Shag carpet was something that they had in the 70s. Uh, I don't know if you guys, similar to this, but you know, not quite as soft. Anyway, so, uh, and this record rolls all the way across the room, a good like 12 feet over to my grandmother's feet. And she's sitting in like this, uh, this chair and the, the record just drops right at her feet. She reaches over, picks it up, and she goes, we need to say a prayer like Aunt Marie just died. And I said, excuse me. And she's like, it's an omen. Like this was the message that Jesus told me to tell her. Uh, and it was earthen vessels, be not afraid. And so like, she's like, we need to say a prayer. She just pat died. And that same time, that same day she died. And to be very honest with you, had I not been in the room and I heard the story described by someone else, I'd be like, okay, like, <laughs> right? Like, you sure like something didn't hit the wall or like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, there's always like, there's gotta be a natural explanation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so that one kind of blew me away um, at a pretty young age, you know, and you think uh, one of the reasons that I do like to talk about miracles is because people think that miracles make all the difference and they just don't like, I think they really get you to think and they kind of like, jog you into a new reality but you don't necessarily stay in that reality very long it's very easy to slip back in life as it was you mm. know and i i just so often think of how many of the followers that saw jesus perform a miracle that went home like astounded didn't go back the next day or the next week or the next month how many of the disciples like when you know in john 6 when he said you know unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood like all of these people left him at that point and whatever miracles they experienced before that they couldn't explain or understand um they just, says they just went back to their former way of life you know and i think that's just really easy to do like uh Miraculous things, I believe, happen actually all the time. But, um, yeah, just kind of life takes over, you know. So, yeah, miracles kind of continued throughout uh, my life. A couple of key ones. Um, the one was, uh, why don't, like, do you want to hear the more dramatic ones or whatever <laughs> <laughs> they're all entertaining okay we've got something special for all our catholic organizations now before you skip past this part it's not an ad it's more like an incredible opportunity to take your digital presence to the next level and i'm gonna let you in on a little secret here something only for our podcast listeners we dm productions have a two-day catholic social media makeover course it's an online course specifically made for Catholic organizations. It will take your social media to the next level. And we make it easier than ever with our step-by-step -step video walkthroughs, cheat sheets, customizable templates, and more. Catholic organizations, let's start creating the quality and results that secular businesses have, but with the depth and beauty of Catholicism. Oh, and did I mention the price? $700. But remember I said I was gonna let you in on a little secret? Use code DM podcast to get it completely free. No credit card required. Just pop that code in and you're all set. Head over to www.dm.productions slash social media makeover or click the link in the description. Now back to the show. Uh, so the one, you know, the one uh, I was, so my wife and I um, were dating and uh, like uh, just, uh, really, uh, I just fell in love with this girl. And uh, like, uh, I remember I was in uh, in mass with her at University of Dayton. 
and I looked down, and this is like a little miracle, but it was like pretty profound for me. I looked down, I saw my class ring, and there was a priest that really, really impacted me in high school that had passed away my senior year. And I, uh, I said a little prayer to him uh, to pray for us, that I really love this girl, I think she's the one, pray for us. Then I just got this overwhelming whatever, um, started crying in the middle of mass. And Michelle had never seen me cry, which is hard to believe if you know me today, because I like cry all the time. Anyways, but <laughs> like uh, I hadn't cried since his funeral, which was about a year and a half earlier. And uh, like it just just hit me at that point, you know, that he had died. And uh, for, for whatever reason, I was greatly impacted by the fact that I never got a chance to tell him I loved him. And I remembered back to some of the things he said to me, and I remembered a miracle that happened when I was with him in high school. I uh, I went to visit him my senior year. Um, long story short, I had a rough time beginning of high school, and he really took me under his wing. And my dad was really struggling with alcoholism at the time, and so um, he kind of became like a surrogate father for me, you know, and uh, just really was there for me. Um, and as high school went on, I grew in confidence, I grew in popularity, and um, I didn't need Father O'Connell as much. And, uh, and so uh, I didn't spend as much time in that relationship. And here he had cancer, and he was dying. And uh, I, like, um, got a message that he wanted to see me. So um, I went up with my parents and we went to go see him and he looked like just a, a shell of the person I remembered, you know, and it was just like really hard. And, um, and so I was trying to make conversation with him and I'm like, like, how are you doing? Like, are you in pain? And he goes, you know, it's, he goes, I'm in a lot of pain, you know, um, he said, and, and I'm like, I mean, are you able to sleep? Do they, do they have you on any meds? He goes, he goes, you know, Ron, I, I, I don't know if you'll believe this. He goes, but every night she comes to me. And I'm like, who, who comes to you, Father? And he's like, Mary, like as plain as you're standing there, right where you're standing, like she's right there. Like, and he goes, all my pain goes away. And I'm able to sleep each night. And she's just there. And I remember thinking to myself, like, what kind of meds do they have him on? <laughs> like, that's that's just where my brain was at. You know what I'm saying? And it was just hard for me to believe, you know. Um, but, you know, there was a couple key things that he had said to me in my life. Um, one was I'd gotten in trouble. I did a lot of stupid things in high school. Loved doing practical jokes, constantly just doing dumb things. This one time I was in the library in one of the uh, one of the cupboards and I was screaming and I could do this really, really high pitched banshee scream. And the librarian was like this 80 year old brother, okay? And he could never figure out where the sound's coming from, okay? Well, all of a sudden the cupboard comes open and somebody grabs me and I stand up and uh, I think it's brother Joe and, uh, and it's Father O'Connell. And he's like, he's like, Basar, because he thought it was another kid, right? <laughs> I don't even know where Basar is in life. He Maybe he'll hear this podcast. Anyways, he thought it was you. Anyways, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so I stand up and then I see Father O'Connell and I see the disappointment on his face. And I am like, I just feel awful, right? <laughs> and uh, so later I go into his office but but he goes when, when he when he realizes it's me, then he gets this really look of sad disappointment, and he goes, "Ron," and I'm like, "Oh my gosh, just <laughs> stab me with a knife!" You know. <laughs> so I go to his office later on that day, and you know, he said, um, he said, uh, "You know, Ron, like God has given you so many beautiful gifts and talents. You have an incredible like gift at making people laugh." He goes, people are attracted to you. He said, you're like, 
going to have to decide. Are you going to use those gifts and talents to glorify Ron or to glorify God? And like, I remember those words not meaning much to me. I just remember the feeling of feeling like I disappointed him. That just really, really bothered me. But it was after his death that those words like really like just hit me, you mm -hmm. know, and I was just like, wow, you know, and I feel like they, they had a lot more impact because of that. So fast forward my life, uh, I was uh, building a, uh, a business uh, and I was speaking around the United States doing talks on uh, goal setting and um, was doing pretty well, was like traveling all the time while going to college, while working co-op. And so Michelle and I are married at this point and I'm never home. Like I'm putting in like no exaggeration, 80 to 100 hours a week doing all these other things. Um, and marriage was kind of really suffering and falling apart. Um, but um, I just uh, uh, finished college and I continue on that pace. Now I'm managing an engineering firm and I'm building a business on the side and I'm like traveling all over the place. And uh, Michelle and I, um, like our, our relationship was hurting just because I was just gone all the time. And uh, she really, really wanted children. And so did I. But she was hoping that that would fill the void of the loneliness. And so um, we pursued uh, medical avenues of like why we couldn't get pregnant and what was going on. And that was just a long process, you know. And for any couples out there that like struggle with infertility, like it's a really painful thing to go through. Um, and as hard as it was for me, it was like so, so hard for my wife, you know. But um, in that process, they determined that there was a surgery that I could have that would possibly up our chances. So I wasn't really excited about getting this surgery, but I was like, okay. So I go in for pre-op on the surgery, and then they determine that uh, I have a problem with my heart. Um, and they're like, we can't operate on you. Like, you have a heart problem. You have a heart issue. And I'm like no I don't I'm like yeah you do so we need to test this and check into this so they did further tests and then they determined that it was a severe case of something called WPW it was actually more severe than they even realized at that point but uh, they're like we need to operate on you for that and we need to do it soon you know so um, um, <clears throat> you know it was supposed to be a pretty basic procedure they were predicting around two and a half three hours well when they actually did the procedure, it turned into to close to 10 hours. Um, I went into vent fib 18 times and uh, they used the paddles on me 12 different times. They said they turned it all the way up three different times. So um, people ask me if I ever like saw like a bright light, you know, um, and actually I did. Uh, so my anesthetic wore off. If you go back to me saying that it was supposed to be a two and a half to three hour procedure. <laughs> and so I woke up in the middle of this thing going on mm -hmm. and the operating room light is like right up. And I look around and there is just like a sea of people. Like there was just so many people in the room. And, uh, and then they were in the middle of shocking me when I woke up. So my back was off the table when I opened my eyes and then I felt my back hit the table. So I was on this metal table um, and like uh, they had one paddle here and then one paddle on the, like my back shoulder. And uh, uh, they had shocked me so hard that I had burn marks there for like over a year in both places. Didn't tan, like, yeah. So, uh, 
And so I woke up like in the middle of them, like, you know what I mean? And then I felt my back hit. And then I heard somebody go, he's coming to, he's coming to knock him out. And that's all I remember till the next day. But I had like three different doctors come in when I did come to. And like two of them were like, like, uh, not going to lie to you. Like things got pretty hairy, like really good to see you doing so well, you know? And, uh, and the third doctor says to me, all I can tell you is someone must really want you alive. Because we thought, you know, we had lost you. And I was like, okay, you know? And it was just kind of, just wake up. Like, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing with my life? Like, you know? He's saying I shouldn't even be here right now. Like, it just, and then I thought about like what Father O'Connell said, like, are you gonna use your gifts to glorify you or glorify God? And, uh, you know, I was just, I was just focused on success. I was focused on being financially free by age 30 and just, you know, and I would just keep telling Michelle, just, just hold on. like. We'll be sitting on a beach someplace in a couple of years and, you know, like look back at all this and just laugh, you know what I mean? And, um, but coming out of that, it really made me like reevaluate just so many things about my own life, you know, and, uh, and I do believe I experienced a miracle, you know, that, uh, that God did, um, like give me a second chance like the the bigger miracle is not so much that I lived through that surgery, although I believe that is a miracle. I believe the bigger miracle is just him giving me a wake up call. Because, uh, you know, unfortunately, sometimes that's what it takes is just some kind of wake up call that like life has more meaning than what we realize. And we're focusing on the wrong things. You know what I mean? Um, but then I, I just think of like all the little things, like all the times I should have died all the times, like I owned dirt bikes as a kid and just so many accidents and split a helmet doing a jump one time and hit a big Oak tree. I hit, I hit a branch that was probably a good, like 12 inches in diameter square. <laughs> and my, my helmet split, like that should have been like my my dad called it a brain bucket but like uh <laughs> yeah it should have been my skull you know and just so many so many things uh i just think um you know by god's grace i get to heaven my guardian angel is gonna punch me <laughs> like <laughs> i think any guy that lives past the age of 20 like it is proof positive that guard, guardian angels actually exist. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> so many dumb things. But anyways, those are just uh, some of the the miracles. Um, uh, before I go into other stories, you guys have any any thoughts or questions on any of that? Like, I don't know. What was the miracle that you said that I knew already? Well, you knew about the surgery. And, no, I didn't. Oh, you didn't? I knew about the record. You did, yeah. but you didn't know about the surgery. No, I didn't. Oh, I thought you knew about, and I, I think like Michelle, like she was a miracle. You know, I dated her sister for a while in high school. Oh um, my gosh. <laughs> that's how Babelicious and I met. Uh, was, yeah, I dated her sister. And then I went to the house one time with the purpose of asking Michelle on a date. And, uh, and her sister answered the door. And I just asked out her sister again. <laughs> I was such a coward. But anyways, I, I think about like how stupid I was in a lot of relationships and uh, like how easy it would have been for my relationship uh, with Michelle's sister to have taken the wrong course or gotten physical and... Uh, I mean, what would be the odds of Michelle and I ended up being married? You know what I'm saying? Like, just wouldn't have happened, you know? Um, so, yeah, that's another message to people. Save, save for marriage. Because mm -hmm. you might end up 
marrying whoever you're dating now's brother or sister. <laughs> yeah. Right? Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks for the advice. Yeah. <laughs> WWJD right there, right? <laughs> no, I, I think there's more meaningful reasons to wait. But anyways, uh, uh, yeah, like, yeah, lots of, lots of little miracles. Uh, our kids were definitely miracles. Like, uh, so Michelle and I never were able to have kids. We tried for a long time and that's actually a lot of fun, but like <laughs> <laughs> we were never able, you know, to have kids. And, uh, I mean, we, we went through all the, in fact, we were even looking down the IVF route and, uh, I remember at the time Michelle saying, I, I think this is actually like against Catholic teaching. Like we should probably talk to Father Jay about it. So I remember initially thinking, well, like, why would it be against teaching? Like, we just, we just want to have kids mm -hmm. and I, I want you to be happy. And this is something that you really desire as well. And. Uh, so we sat down with Father Jay and he kind of explained the teaching and and I remember not being at peace with it not being like oh okay that makes a lot of sense um, I just remember thinking I don't really understand this teaching or the logic behind it but I think we need to be obedient so we we didn't go down that route and i'm so glad we didn't because today i a hundred percent agree with the church's teaching mm -hmm. and it took me years to get to the point where i um understood the the meaning behind it and you know a lot of the um the logic behind it you know um so yeah that it was a miracle that just being obedient you know even though kind of want to do our own thing because we think what we're, what we want is a good you know mm -hmm. um so that was a good thing but uh we ended up adopting uh two boys uh they were at the time seven and nine um and so we went through a foster to adopt process and uh james and jordan were being fostered by um michelle's sister and and her husband and um we were like their aunt and uncle okay and uh they had some challenges and they weren't uh sure that they were really able to take on uh the adoption what ended up happening was the the thought the whole time was that the boys would be reunited with their birth parents but uh the birth parents uh both ended up um in jail for a pretty good period of time uh, to do with meth and um, and so like then we were given like I think eight hours because the the uh, the state had reached its limit of how much time the state could have custody and this all fell apart last minute and so now they needed to find a family to adopt like now so we were given like eight hours to decide <laughs> and uh so we went to the chapel over at st helen it used to be in the garage how crazy is that okay so the the garage for the rectory they took a bay of the garage and they turned it into this really beautiful little chapel and it was a 24-hour adoration chapel okay so we're in there and we're having a very high level discussion literally yelling in front of Jesus, okay, uh, about making a decision to do this. And Michelle was like, we could do this. And I'm like, you know what? We can, but the reality is, do we know what we're getting into? Like, do we, like, are we ready for this? Like, we can't do it because it's theoretically a really good thing to do. Like, is this something we can do? Is this something, you know, and... Um, and by the grace of God, after being in there for, I don't know how long, I really don't, I know it was over an hour, but we were in there for a while and, uh, uh, 
Thank God no one else had a time during that time. Or they did, and they went outside the door and they hear this couple inside yelling. They're like, okay, maybe we'll come back to visit Jesus another time. Anyways, so, uh, uh, but I had a peace afterwards. Yeah, I had a peace and I was like, okay. So we said yes and, uh, you know, had no idea what all that meant. Um, but thank God we didn't, um, because it was a lot harder than we ever anticipated it could be. But at the same time, it was a lot more beautiful. I think it's like marriage. Like, uh, if, if people knew before they got married, how hard the hard times would be, they would never get married. Okay. But then they would miss out on how good mm -hmm. the good things is you know mm -hmm. and like and and like the the growth that comes through going through those hard times together i think going through those hard times together for michelle and i was uh so life-giving to our marriage because we we got to a point where we had no one else but each other and god like nobody else understood really our family probably came closest to understanding, but nobody really understood, you know. Our one son had reactive attachment disorder and um, just things were really difficult in our home, you know. And there was years where we had police at our house on a fairly regular basis, which, you know, you have to wonder what your neighbors think of you, <laughs> you know. Um, but, um, yeah, I think... Uh, so many miracles because had we been able to have children i don't know that we would have adopted i just don't like would we have ever really been open to that you know and then our last one that was a was a total miracle um so you know we always wanted a baby um and so you know we were on a wait list for a long time for that and uh then a gynecologist friend of michelle calls her and lets her know that I'm working with this young couple and um, they are not ready to have children and there's some like issues that they're dealing with and they were considering their options and wanted to know if I knew anybody that might be good adoptive parents Jeez. up three o'clock <laughs> time to pray <laughs> scared me oh my god yeah it's like I, that's not mine oh my goodness well, right. let's let's actually pray okay <laughs> okay all right um father son holy spirit amen we'll just do a like a chaplet uh quick uh decade um so uh i'd like to pray for my sons i'd like to pray for all those that are struggling in their own relationship with God for all those struggling in their marriage um, I'd like to pray for all the souls in purgatory for all those that I said I would pray for um, for this podcast that it um, reaches someone that just for whatever reason needs hope yeah any other uh, for your great grandpa mm -hmm. and um my brother and my cousin who all passed away within the last year wow. mm -hmm. <laughs> i want to pray for somebody but not name drop them <laughs> so uh, for somebody that i'm thinking of uh, for them to reveal or for god to reveal himself to them in a very specific and unique way that they need can understand and I want to pray for my uh, son's sobriety and for um, a special intention eternal father I offer you the body blood soul and divinity of your dearly beloved son our Lord Jesus Christ in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy, mercy on us and on the whole world. world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, 
have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, and for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, help me trust in you. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Yeah, so that's my three o'clock alarm. I forgot to shut off. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'm glad you didn't shut it off. Yeah. Why not? It's uh <clears throat> a catholic thing mm -hmm. you know and this seems to do have something to do with cath catholics right this podcast right? yeah a little bit <laughs> yeah you, you heard something it. in the title right <laughs> so i didn't know if i mentioned but i'm catholic is that okay that's okay right, that's cool all right good. um yeah so uh our our so this gynecologist then says well i i have this child that um th this couple like are you guys interested and we're like yeah you know so she goes okay well let me talk to them so she talks to them they're interested she goes okay well i'll draft up the paperwork and everything we'll get the ball rolling she goes um and that that took a couple days and then she was like okay i'll 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 do it when i get back i'm heading out on vacation but when i get back so then while she was on vacation we get a call from the county that another baby had come available okay and uh so they were like there is like 17 other couples and are we interested and i'm like looking at michelle i'm like <laughs> she goes yes and i'm like for both <laughs> she's like yes and i'm like <laughs> okay you know <laughs> yes yes we're interested you know and so then um uh and and obviously our marriage and everything else had kind of definitely uh turned a lot for the better after uh kind of reprioritizing life you know what i mean um but uh when uh <clears throat> when they went through the selection process, we ended up getting selected, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, and two of the criteria that the parents wanted was either that the parents were Catholic or Lutheran, that there was uh, three, that there was other children in the home. So had we not adopted James and Jordan, like it would have never happened. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, that there was humor in the home, okay? and uh check that yeah it's my wife right so anyways uh <laughs> and so we were selected well the gynecologist comes back only to find out the girl that she was working with went into labor super early and they panicked and so they went through an agency and she had no idea how to tell michelle like she just felt awful you know so she went to the hospital um, to check on the mother and then she stuck around to see who was adopting the baby and it was us that showed up so like we got selected twice for the same baby what yeah oh <laughs> almost makes you believe in god doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> anyways so you know that was a miracle you know and uh, yeah so it's it's he's a miracle being part of our family you know um, and then the, the last, uh, groupings of miracles that I'm going to talk about today, uh, have to do with my, uh, middle son, James. Um, so, uh, 
yeah, he's gone through a lot. Uh, both him and his brother were very abused as children. Um, and, uh, and for him, um, it was at a pretty young age through about age six. And, uh, but his, his mind is blocked out all of it. Um, so that's why he's, you know, dealt with reactive attachment disorder and, um, uh, I mean, gone through like 11 counselors and just, just, just a long road. Well, uh, he ended up getting, um, uh, addicted to drugs, uh, at a pretty young age. Um, so, uh, it went from, uh, marijuana to pills, uh, and eventually to, uh, methamphetamine, um, which was the drug of choice from his birth parents. And it's believed that he was possibly born in utero, uh, with that in his system. So it's just been a super long road. Um, and he, uh, at times has done heroin. Um, and, um, there's at least seven times that we know of that he has OD'd. Uh, and one of the times was so severe that uh, the police had informed us that his dealer had pushed him out of the car onto a sidewalk uh, in front of University Hospital. And um, they literally had to revive him. Um, and uh like yeah it's a miracle that he's still still here you know um and there's a lot of people praying for him and i would appreciate anybody that's listening to this if you could um pray for him um last he's he's been um uh, in and out of jail in and out of prison um and he's was going through treatment uh he was at a halfway house um and last night i got calls through the night uh that um just from him he had relapsed so he was in a pretty bad way um which is um yeah it's just hard um so if you guys could pray for him and he was one of the people we prayed for in that chaplet so but it's a miracle that he is still alive and i still have hope um i have hope in christ um i actually had a dream that him and i were speaking to a pretty large crowd uh and um speaking on hope and on um father-son relationship and um, our relationship with God and um, that dream has given me some hope like I really pray that it's that it is a sign of that he's gonna make it through this like there's so many people that have prayed for him and like there is so much good that God can do in and through him um yeah, and I, I believe, you know, I believe that God can just bring some great things out of it, you know, um, mm -hmm. and bring hope to a lot of other people. Um, so I hold on to that and just, you know, pray for that, you know. Yeah, <clears throat> so I think uh, in the end... Um, that miracles do really like help to give people a reason for hope and give them like um some kind of um idea that like this isn't just all in our head that this is real mm -hmm. that like god is real and that life does have purpose and meaning but in the end i don't think that miracles um change our lives as much as we think they would like um it's just real easy 
for, as scripture says in John 6, to go back to our former way of life. Um, mm -hmm. It's very easy to justify away. Uh, so many beautiful miracles that happen on a daily basis. Um, in ministry, so many miracles that I've seen in other people, like God just doing miraculous things in his relationship with them that uh, we can often just kind of get used to. As weird as that sounds in ministry, like uh, that you just, somebody really wise told me, never, ever, ever get used to the miraculous. Like, like anyone that like, like finds Christ, like it's a miracle, you know? And it's like, don't ever take that for granted, you know? Uh, often people will have like a transformation on like a high school retreat or something like that. And it's real easy to get a little cynical to be like, well, we'll see. We'll see how long this lasts. Mm -hmm. We'll see where this goes based on that person's lifestyle or, or decisions that they've made in their past. But like never, never take that miracle for granted. Um, so, you know, we see those things, but like the greatest miracle, as I shared before we started the, the podcast, was uh, I believe uh, the whole dying to self, mm -hmm. um, to be willing to die to your own desires, some of them selfish, some of them just things you wanted, like things you wanted to do with your life, things that you always had hoped for or dreamed of or whatever it is, but dying to ourselves for love of others. Because um, I, I think any marriage that lasts is a miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, that may sound so anti-romantic or anti-Disney, you know, <laughs> happily ever after. You just have to write, meet the right person and you live happily ever after. And it's just not true. Like, it's just not true. Um, it takes uh, the Paschal Mystery. It takes dying to yourself for love of the other um, for a marriage to work. And, um, and I think that's a miracle. And that miracle is God. And I don't care if the couple is atheist or uh, Christian, uh, that like the miracle is still God, it's still the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, just teaching them what it means to love. Um, and love, I think, goes beyond just willing the good of the other. I think w love that is salvific is a love that uh, is willing to sacrifice for the other. And not just willing to, but does, you know, without the other even knowing. Mm -hmm. that, that maybe you never get any kudos or credit or anything, um, but that you just, you just want that good for the other, you know, um, that I think is agape. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Did the dying to self, like kind of landing the plane on your story about, uh, like right after surgery. Yeah. Like, wow. This is the wake up call. Yeah what happened after that? Like you were traveling around doing a ton of different things, being yeah. super involved with work. I mean, shortly after that, um, I mean, Michelle and I, like we, uh, started going to adoration every week. Um, we both signed up for times and we would just spend time with Christ and we reprioritized our marriage. I started to travel a lot less. Um, I started to just put God and uh, then marriage ahead of my ambitions, you know, mm. and uh, it was within less than a year that I left engineering and went into youth ministry full time. So mm. um, it was, uh, Michelle came home from adoration one night around, I don't know, it was around 3 a.m., she woke me up and she's like, are you happy? And I'm like, oh crap. 
<laughs> like, what is this? Right? Yes, I'm happy. Are you? <laughs> like, do I want to ask this? And come on, I've been trying. Like, things have changed, right? You know? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I, she goes, because I got a strong message in adoration tonight that God wants you to do something like more with youth ministry. And I just want you to know that we'll be okay. And I remember like, um, kind of being like bewildered because that just wasn't normal language for my wife. And I'm like, why didn't you become a prophet? Right. You know, like <laughs> prophetess. Um, and I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to go to <laughs> Good sleep. Good <laughs> night, you know. And then it was about, I don't know, like three months later, this job opening came up down at St. Mary in Hudson. And uh, when I used to do those goal setting sessions, I always told people that someday I'd like to do youth ministry full time for free, like retire and just do that, you know. And, uh, it was an altruistic goal that had some selfish uh, motivations behind it. Um, so you do it for free, then you can kind of do it your way, right? You know, and um, but yeah, it was. I had like three or four people call me and ask me if I was gonna. I'm like, no, now's not the time because my business had taken a hit after 9/11 and uh, still had not recouped and. Um, so, and then Michelle just said, do you remember that night in adoration? And I was like, yeah. She goes, maybe you should just look into it. Mm -hmm. So I did. And now she kicks herself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause it was like, uh, you know, it was a lot less money than what I used to make, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but like, so, so, so good. So beautiful. So life giving. Um, yeah. And it was just, and that was before we adopted any of the boys, you know? Um, and that was just, a, a very beautiful piece in the journey. Um, and just so many miracles that I've experienced through that, you know? Um, but I, uh, I just feel blessed, you know, and I feel again, spoiled. Um, you know, I'm like, God, why have you revealed yourself so like significantly and blatantly when so many other people like, like are starved for something, mm -hmm. anything, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, is it is it because I'm so weak that I need that much? You know what's you know, um, and I don't know the answer to that. I I, I do think that uh, obviously God has His reasons, and uh, I do feel very blessed, and and I do also feel um, a little bit burdened, you know, because I think. Uh, yeah, I, I think to whom much is given, like a lot is expected, you know, and I don't, I don't have any excuse because um, I've been given a lot, you know, uh, and I, I think he just wants me to share that with other people. Yeah. Did we land the plane? <laughs> <laughs> we did. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Should we pray? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Sorry for the gross sounds there. <laughs> <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Lord, 
You are so good. You are the giver of all good things. Help us to see the miracles around us in our own lives on a daily basis. Help us to realize the unseen miracles, the things, the times that our life has been saved and we are completely unaware of it. Help us to remember those dramatic moments Help us to realize the gift of life itself, of every newborn child, of every last breath. Um, help us just to realize how blessed we are and how loved we are. And help us to share that hope with other people and help them to see uh, miracles in their own life. And thank you, Lord, for the ultimate gift of dying, of making the ultimate sacrifice of reputation and of life itself for love of us and help us to learn how to die to ourselves, to our own desires, good and bad for love of others, but especially for love of you. And um, I just ask you to bless all marriages, all vocations, um, and help us, Lord, to do your will and to glorify you through those. I pray for anyone struggling with addiction I pray for those that have family members struggling uh, just for their hope and their strength. Um, and for all of those struggling in their relationship with you, Lord, that are grasping for any reason to believe that you would just give them that hope, Lord, and help them to know your love and your presence in some small way and help us to be that for others. Any other intentions? That was really good. You covered everything. Okay, did I? <laughs> you did. <laughs> that, that was the all-encompassing prayer. <laughs> well, that one you might Amen. actually want to memorize if that's true. Yeah. We'll play this song. Yeah, I mean, the Our Father is pretty good, but let's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> actually, let's do that one. Uh, Our, Father, Our Father who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come. Thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks for doing this. This was great. Yeah. So. All right. Well, have a great day. And if I don't uh, see you again, uh, have a great life and good luck on heaven. Peace out. <laughs> I'm not going to drop it. I'm not going to drop it. <laughs>